Um, good morning, everybody. Didn't expect this, my next comment to be on the live stream, but if anyone happens to know how to work the light switch, we could maybe add some of the lights a little bit. I don't want us to all be all too slumbery and tired this morning. Not super bright, but also not like completely dark, and that way we kind of be in between the middle a bit. That's great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Because if you know, you know, the light switches here are weird, and there's about five buttons for like 10 different settings. And good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Woo! Wow. See, the lights had to come on first before Steph could wake up. That's how it works Sunday mornings. I'm excited to be here. I'm thankful to be here that we can come together to worship Jesus together. Guys, before we get started, I want to let you know, feel free to go to the back uh, later on after or, um, you know, get some coffee. There's more pastries than Tim Hortons knows what to do with in the back as well, I just discovered. And we got some new books, and we'll discuss that too later on on the, on the side table. Things to keep you uh, replenished and restored, but the main thing, the one real thing that's going to get us replenished and restored here this morning is coming before God in his presence. He invites us before him, before the throne. And, you know, that can be kind of like a scary thing when you think about it, right? Like there's that terrifying aspect to come before God, a holy God, a righteous God, an all-powerful God who makes, you know, the biggest hurricane kind of look like a sneeze. That can be a terrifying thing to do, especially when you are like so small and puny, or we are so small and puny, all of us. Me too. I'm going to read our opening passage, that we're actually invited, more than invited. God yearns for us to come into his presence as individuals, to find not, you know, shaking in our boots, worshipful fear and terror that we're going to be struck down for making a mistake in how we sing, or that we're not going to get it right and he's going to throw us off, you know, the cliff or something. Now, God, this almighty, powerful God in Christ Jesus is yearning for us to come before him to have rest, to have peace. To in this broken world have forgiveness. So our opening passage, invitation to worship. Matthew chapter 11. In verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's pray. Where could we find anything like you, God? And for many of us who have searched all throughout what this world offers, what this world promises us and waves before us and tantalizes us with? Our answer is nowhere. We can't find anything like you in this world. A place where we can truly be at rest, where we can find love and acceptance unconditionally for, for us to be loved and then protected and taken in. God, it is all about you this morning because you are the one who stands out above all your creation, greater than all your creation, holy, sinless, perfect. But also you made us to know you, to glorify you, and to enjoy you. And so it is not surprising that nothing truly can satisfy us like you can, like you do. May we confirm that in our time this morning to worship you, to put everything before you, God, to lay everything down at our feet before you, God, and elevate you in the midst, elevate you in our hearts, elevate you in our eyes. For all the glory and the honor and the power are indeed yours, Jesus. And we have known that and tasted that for what, because of what you have done for us. In Christ's name, amen.
One, two. Hi, good morning. Um, let's all stand and uh, we'll sing some songs here together. presence my life be thou my wisdom and thou my true word I ever with thee and thou with me Lord thou my great father and I thy true Son, thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Riches I eat not, nor man's empty praise, thou my inheritance now and always, thou and thou only first in my heart I king of heaven my treasure thou art I king of heaven my victory won may I reach heaven's joys bright Heaven Son, out of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, no ruler of all. Still be my vision, no ruler of all. Amen, Lord. We call upon you to be our vision, Lord, and we study your word, Lord, and we ask that you would open our, our eyes and the eyes of our hearts, Lord, to see clearly in this world that is just plagued, Lord, with deception and lies, that you would point us to the truth, Lord, that in a world that, that likes to say that God is love, Lord, we pray that you would teach us what that means, that you would define love, Lord. We cannot simply say love is love. We cannot define a term by itself, Lord. So we just pray that you would guide us and lead us and be our vision, Lord, that we would lean not on our own understanding, but to seek understanding from the one true living God. Answered me and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on him are radiant. They'll never be ashamed. They'll never be ashamed. This poor man cried. me from my enemies, the Son of God surrounds his saints, you will deliver them, you will deliver them, magnify the Lord. 
Come exalt His name Together glorify the Lord with me Come exalt His name forever Taste and see that the Lord is good Blessed is he who hides in him. Oh, fear the Lord. Oh, all you saints, he'll give you everything. He'll give you everything. Magnify the Lord with me. Come exalt His name together. Glorify the Lord with me. Come exalt His name forever. you 
heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. Only there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. and our faith in you, Lord. And I echo Cody on the scripture that he read, Lord, when you said, when Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and that you would give us rest, Lord. It's not about our performance, Lord, and so long as we think that it's about our performance that we can somehow earn our way into your good graces and earn our way into heaven, Lord. The performance never stops. And what happens, Lord, when we won't give up the show, when we won't give up the performance, when we rely too heavily on our works, Lord, and someone comes around and makes us look bad, what do we do but condemn those who affect our perception of our own performance, who we perceive to make our good works look bad, Lord? When we turn to you, we put our faith in Christ Jesus Amen. for his performance and for his work and for what he has done for us that we may have rest and that we can know and admit, Lord, that we are broken, Lord, that we are flawed, that we are sinners, Lord, we are many things, Lord, but above all, we are deeply loved and cherished and adored 
to the point that you would give your only son to die on our behalf, Lord. And we just pray that everyone here would, would understand that, Lord, on a deep level, Lord, that you would touch the hearts and the minds of everyone in this room this, uh, this morning, Lord. Uh, we just pray that your spirit now would be over Pastor Cody as he reads from your word, Lord, that it would be a blessing to everyone here and that we would just rest, Lord, in you. In Jesus' name, amen. That's actually for my coffee. Yeah, I got too many things to carry up. Okay, this morning our talk is going to be a little bit different, guys. Instead of me teaching you something, I want you to teach me something. All right? So tell me, what is one thing that we can do to be more like Jesus? Okay, pray. Because, you know, Jesus prayed. He prayed a lot. Yeah. Well, that's... All right, I'm going to go on a tangent. I'm going to just, like, we could talk about that later. Any other? Right, what, what are we, one each. Sin as much. Okay, you don't have to sin as much. Hmm, but we are sinners, yes. It's interesting. All right, well, Sally, what do you, what do you got? Having a straw in your mouth prevents you from talking. Hey, we're a little too shy. Well... Do you know one thing that is interesting? In the last song we sang, right, we said, like, you know, we're going to trust in God's love and have that firm sense of life in God's love. But I'm going somewhere with this, guys. One way, one really important way that we can be like Jesus, I guess I am teaching you guys something in the end anyway, is that we don't rely on our own power and strength. Jesus showed us what reliance on God is like. And we often get things wrong. We are sinners. We're going to make mistakes. And if we keep trying not to be sinners, we're always going to end up despairing every time we fail. Right? And it's true. We are supposed to pray. But you know what? The guys who hated Jesus the most, they also prayed a lot too. Right? It's not so simple as just doing the stuff, but relying on God's love and knowing that he loves us. Being Assured of that in our hearts is, I think, one of the most powerful ways we can be like Jesus. Let's pray for our kids as they go and learn more about being like Jesus in their lesson. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for them and, and to hear how you are, see how before our own eyes you are growing them in knowledge of you, strengthening them in faith. We pray that you continue to develop, build them up, nourish and nurture their hearts, minds, and souls. Lead them and their teacher this morning in their lesson to bless them abundantly. Protect them and watch over them in Christ's name. Amen. All right, guys, head on out. All right, good morning, and good morning for anyone who's uh, just uh, coming and joining us here, whether in person or online. Uh, as you guys notice, we're starting a new sermon series. Are you excited? Maybe I'm excited. You know what? I'm not going to lie. I'm excited because 1 Corinthians is one of my favorite books of Scripture. So I've been like, and I've known this was coming for a while as I've been preparing it, so I've been like just excited because I love reading 1 Corinthians, but I like sharing from 1 Corinthians. So I'm really thankful by God that we are here and get to uh, get to explore this 
this letter really is what it is, right? This letter, uh, this ancient letter together. And I just want to shout out and thank Sonia, who's now with the kids, for putting together this uh, new, new video for us and everything to get us in that set of exploring something that is, yes, very ancient. It was written in 54 AD, um, but is still endlessly relevant as it really applies to a lot of things that we face today. Let's um, open with prayer, and then I want to just jump in with laying a bit of a foundation. Uh, Father God, Lord, you are the one who creates that foundation for us. We've been singing that in our worship, Lord. Um, so we pray for that, continually to build upon the foundation of faith that you've given us. Lord, you do so in your word. So I pray that you would open our eyes today, our hearts today, to hear you speak. Lord, um, there is constantly sin wrestling within us, our own selfishness, our own pride wrestling within us. Lord, you are the antidote to that. You are the purity and the truth to that, to, to conquer that. And so, God, I pray that we would be open to receiving your word, Lord, to continue to shape us and form us to be more like you. God, um, lead us. Lead me as I speak. Uh, I pray that we would only have room for you to, to hear you today. And we thank you for your word and for your goodness and your grace towards us. In Christ's name, amen. Mm. So I want to lay down that foundation before we jump into our letter this morning. And it rem when I think of that foundation, have, you, have we all really like done both the receiving of criticism in our lives and also given people criticism in our lives? We know that experience quite well. When I first left home when I was 18, I joined a, a volunteer program for young adults, and, and they moved us across the country, and we had to live together. Uh, there was about like 20 of us who were between 18 and 21. And because, you know, we're a bunch of like teenagers kind of leaving home for the first time, probably don't know how to live with other people outside your family, one of the weekly activities we had to do at the dinner table, because we all had to eat together, was that we would have to uh, critique one another at the dinner table. So you, like that, like Friday night or whatever, you'd be eating supper, and you know, you were kind of like that person, you know, now you have to say two good things that they did this week and one bad thing. We had to have that, that experience over it for, for about nine months, that program lasted. You were always criticizing both the negative and positive. And I think if you've ever given criticism, you've been taught that, you know, you say something nice first and then, and then Give, give, give the criticism. Cynically, it's like, well, they're not going to take the bad things so bad if we just say something nice about them at the beginning, right? Um, but ideally, the real truth of why we do that is because when you're giving someone negative criticism, again, ideally, not if you're, you know, in a bad mood, is to actually help the person grow. You want that person to respond positively, take the feedback, and whatever this negative thing is, is to, to stop doing that and do something positive. You know, it, we're looking for the benefit of the person we're criticizing. So to give that positive feedback first is a way of saying that I know that you are more than your mistakes. I know that you are better than when you, I see you at your worst. Because when we receive negative feedback, it really balloons in our face. Right now, if we've Think of the time when you've been receiving negative feedback. That's all of a sudden you're like, that's all you see. This bad thing about you. And it's like, you know, being splashed with a whole bucket of paint. It feels terrible. And so that positive angle is just like saying, like, this, there's more to you than this. I recognize that. This bad thing that I'm bringing up is not the whole story. Now, in the church, right, as followers of Jesus, we take that foundation to its roots, it isn't so much that, hey, you've, you've, you've messed up, you've made this mistake. Look, I know that you do some good things too. No, it goes far deeper than that. You're more than your negative side. You're more than your positive side. In fact, the deepest, most important fundamental truth about you is that you are loved by God. You are a son of God or you are a daughter of God. Jesus suffered on the cross because of how much he loves you. That's the truth about who you are. That's the identity a chosen one of God. That's my foundation. I recognize that about you. Moving forward, we can now address things that need to be addressed because that fundamental truth doesn't change. And that brings us to, to the letter, the first letter to the church in Corinth. Because as we're going to see this morning, that is exactly what Paul does. 
That is exactly how he starts this letter because this is one of the most harshest letters in the New Testament. It's also the second longest of Paul's letters that we have in the Bible. He is gonna go through 16 chapters addressing problems, sins, and mistakes that the believers in this church are making. It's a bit heavy at times. It's a bit cringy at times. And it's always challenging. You see, Paul started this church in ancient Corinth. We have a map up, actually. We're going to throw that up, Ivan. The church in Corinth, right there in, in what's nowadays uh, present Greece. Paul planted the church in Corinth in around uh, 50 AD. And he wrote back to the church about three to four years later because he had gotten news from people in the church and, and, and other people who have been kind of going through the, the, in the ancient early church community about problems, things that either they've been doing wrong, uh, disputes that have been coming up, all sorts of bad news. So he writes this letter back to them right when he is actually in the city of Ephesus. Now, the thing about Corinth, which makes it kind of interesting, is that it's kind of a lot like what we would expect in a modern city today. Corinth was cosmopolitan. You have this young church, these new believers gathering together in a city that was one of the largest in the Roman Empire. It was bustling with commerce. You can see it's kind of in that little spot where you could kind of just cut through with the the Aegean and the Ionian Sea right there. So there's a lot of trade, a lot of commerce. There's a lot of different people there. It's multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-linguistic. This is a pluralistic city in a really pluralistic society. Religions, they got them all. If you want to worship something, you'll find it in Corinth. All sorts of different customs and, and way of doing things. And in the Roman Empire and in the Greek mindset, these things all would just kind of mingle together in like one giant melting pot. And it was the same thing with morality and ethics. Different people thinking of different ways to do life and often just kind of going, well, whatever feels good for you works out as long as you kind of fit in with some random structure that we all agree with. It's eerily modern. It's very much kind of like Montreal, in fact. And so not surprisingly, the believers that are coming out of this society, that's another thing about the church in Corinth, there were certainly some Jews in there, but there were a lot of Gentiles. They were coming out of this kind of culture, this pluralistic environment, and they were trying to figure out how to live holy lives before God, yet also still within this context that they had been raised in. And of course, then their takeoff into faith had a few bumps. And that's what Paul is going to step in to address. Well, let's turn there now. We'll open with 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul, called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in him in every way, in all speech, all knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also, he will also strengthen you to the end, so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So that's the opening. In many ways, that's a very typical way to open a letter in the ancient Greek world. But it's a beautiful opening. Remember, everything that follows, and that's why we're stopping there today, because right after this, he is going to dive into problems. He is going to be bringing the 
much needed but negative criticism. And yet he opens it with that sure foundation, grace, peace, thankfulness, appointing them directly to God. I want to draw our attention to verse 2, right at the very beginning. This just might be the most powerful verse in the entire letter. To the church at God of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus called as saints. Just think about that for a moment. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus called as saints. What comes to your mind when you think of saints? You see, even if you're not growing up maybe the Catholic context where you think of saints as that official kind of group of really, really, really holy believers, our culture takes that meaning with saint. Saints, the, 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 the holiest among us, the most pleasing to God, the best Christians. Maybe many of us are actually uncomfortable to really say that about ourselves, you know, especially on a, maybe a bad week where we really struggled with our own devotion, our own prayer life. I don't really feel like a saint today. In all of the ancient church, you go back to that map. In every one of those cities, there's a church. And when we look at the letters, the Corinthians, by human standards, let's just say it, are the least saintly. Now, what does Paul say when he's about to address all of these issues? He greets them as saints. You are saints, he reminds them. Sanctified in Christ Jesus. Sanctified, right? We've talked about that. You're consecrated, set apart, made holy. In other words, you could say, he's opening this letter to the Corinthians and he says, God's holy ones. That's how he greets them. God's holy people. It's all in that context. How powerful of a truth that is that in the midst of the ways they're not measuring up, they are called God's holy ones. It brings us back to that identity. Verse four makes that even more clear. I thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. Your holiness, your sanctity, your sanctifiedness, your identity as God's people. You didn't earn it. Look at your behavior. You didn't earn it. But look at your behavior. You didn't lose it. That's what he's saying. He's getting their eyes off of themselves and everything that they're going to talk about, he's going to put them firmly in place to receive all of this information, all of this crit criticism Rightly justify criticism. You are not called holy because of what you did or didn't do. What you can or can't do. You are holy, dearly loved, sanctified, set apart because of the grace of God. Because you are in Christ Jesus. If you ever go into Paul's letters, you'll see him say that a lot. He'll always say, in Christ. In Christ to this, in Christ to that. And maybe it sounds a little confusing. And he's just, he's rooting everything in our salvation, in faith. Being in Christ means that we are saved, that we are counted among those whom Christ has died for. And that theology gets built out by saying, if you've come to have faith in Jesus, that Jesus died on behalf of your sin and brokenness personally, then Jesus covers you, right? His death covers for yours. So you are forgiven and given new life. And his righteous life is now given to you because he covers you. So what becomes true of Jesus, God declares to be true of you. So going forward in life, even though you may screw up, your Christian life doesn't look perfect. God forgives it and still looks at you as in Christ in Jesus, covered by him, perfect. 
That's why he can go to the Corinthians and say, you're holy. Man, we're going to go in the letter. Have, who here has read this letter? Raise your hands, 1 Corinthians. Figured that would be the case. So some of you know what I'm talking about. Other of you are just going to have to imagine it. And that's cool because we'll get it and explore it together. But there are some ways, and they're really not what we would call holy. And yet Paul goes to them right at the beginning and says, you are holy. There's no half measure here. That's what's so startling. It's not like you almost got it. It's like, no, you are wholly, completely covered by God. It doesn't matter what you failed to do because Jesus died for you. It's a beautiful foundation. It's a powerful foundation. And he continues on. Verses five, six, and seven. What is he talking about here? Gifts of knowledge. Spiritual gifts. They don't lack any of them. The testimony of Christ is confirmed in their midst because of their speech and their knowledge. Let me tell you, when we get into the book, they have bad views about like speech. They get hung up on, on that in a, in a sinful way. They have sinful understandings about knowledge and they turn these good things into ways to judge and hurt others. They're all over the place when it comes to spiritual gifts. Paul isn't commending them for what they're doing. He's not commending their own activity, their own actions. These are actually areas of sin. But they're also areas where God is at work, where God is alive. The testimony of Christ is confirmed in their midst, not because of them, but because of the presence of Jesus himself. That's what Paul is saying. Paul says, I can see that God is working in your midst. I can see that you have the gifts. I can see that you are, you are trying to figure it out and God is there leading you, even in the midst of your brokenness, even in the midst of the things you get wrong. God is there powerfully among you. He's not commending them. He's commending Christ in their midst. What's so beautiful about that, again, is it's coming back. It's not about them foundation. It's not on their shoulders. It's on the shoulders of Jesus. He's getting them to lift their eyes off of their own situation and look before them to see Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And if it's all about Jesus, right, if it's all about Jesus at the very beginning, saving them from their sin and brokenness through his death on the cross. If that's how it started, and it's confirmed in their midst, in their life, as they wrestle with, with trying to be a church, if it's continued to be Jesus, and all about Jesus, it's going to end that way too. I'm going to reread verse 8 and 9. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. It's tempting to think in our worst days, in our biggest mess-ups, that maybe after a while God just grows tired of putting up with us. Maybe after a while, we've truly confirmed that we're really not good enough for Jesus' death. Not good enough for God. Or we've finally done it this time, and now God's going to, like, give us the boot. With the long laundry list of things that the Corinthians are going to have to face, it could be reasonable for them to say, yeah, you know what, <laughs> God probably wants to just, you know, burn our church down and, and, and do away with us and, and stick with the rest of them. And Paul doesn't go there. It starts with Jesus. It's sustained by Jesus. It will be carried on to completion by Jesus. He says it throughout many of his letters. I'm going to read from the letter to the church in Philippi. And he says in chapter 1, verse 6, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 
And perhaps one of the most powerful versions of that is in the letter that he wrote to the church in Rome. It's sometimes called the golden chain. He writes, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. It's like links to a chain, these different steps. And simply all it means is that at the very beginning, he chooses you and saves you. And at the very end, he confirms that in eternity. He doesn't change his mind. Because as the Bible tells us, as God tells us through his word, he's not like people. He's not like a human being who changes his mind. He is perfect and he is changeless. So if he has worked to save you, he will never let you go. Paul is assuring the Corinthians of that foundation, of that identity as beloved and chosen in Christ. You are sanctified and holy in Christ. And that identity, no matter what, will not change. God is working through you, and he will bring you to the end. Stop looking at your own self. We're going to be visiting all of those issues. But don't look at yourself as so much to forget that God is the one who is going to deliver you. Get your eyes off yourself and see yourself as small and see that God is the one who is large. God is the one who has made you holy and who will confirm that at the very end. It's a beautiful foundation. And it is just so hard for many followers of Jesus to hold on to. Now, I want to come back to the basic gospel for a minute. And that's where it starts. And if you're here today just visiting me for the first time, the foundation of what we believe as followers of Jesus, we are all in need of God's grace and forgiveness because we've all messed up. We've all made mistakes, screwed up, hurt other people. It's called sin. We all are guilty of it. And so Jesus dies as a punishment for that. So that then when we believe that his death was for us, that's faith, that's trust in God, he forgives us. That's his part of the promise. He forgives us. And after that forgiveness, we are brought into his family. It says he adopts us as his own. He loves us. He sees us as little brother, little sister to Jesus, like Jesus. That's the foundation. You can't change that. You can't earn that. That's what grace is all about. It's accepting what Jesus has done for us and admitting that we need that to begin with. There is no working our way in or earning a sense of favor with God. And yet, as we go forward then, following Jesus, living the Christian life, we forget it. We forget it so often. I love this quote by Dane Ortland in Gentle and Lowly. He says, there are two ways to live the Christian life. I hope you'll see that one is the proper way, one is a broken way. You can live it either for the heart of Christ or from the heart of Christ. You can live for the smile of God or from it. For a new identity as a son or daughter of God or from it. For your union with Christ or from it. Do you ever think that God is disappointed in you as a Christian? Now, I want to use gentle words like that. Do you ever think he's disappointed in you? Maybe displeased or unhappy. Because we're all going to say we know that we're forgiven, so he's not wrathful towards us or something. But do you ever think he's disappointed in you? Do you know that he, Jesus chose to die at you, die for you? Understanding you and seeing you in your worst day possible, in the worst light imaginable. And he is more sensitive to sin 
He is more angered, more furious over sin and brokenness and evil than you are. So of all things that exist, God hates your sin more than you do. He sees you that way and then has so much love for you that he suffers and dies for you. Do you think that when you went and screwed up yesterday that all of a sudden he's mad? His unchanging love? That's what the quote is getting at. That's what Dean Ortland is getting at. That's what Paul is getting at here. When we think we've displeased someone, we want to earn that back a little bit. Oh, I'll do it better next time. That's not how it works. You can't ever live to earn a bit more of, of God's love for you. You can't please God anymore. He sees you as Jesus. He accepts you as his own child. You're already maxed out. That's what Paul is getting at. That's the foundation. That's the identity. And you see, we are afraid to go that far often in our teaching and preaching in the church. We're afraid to take grace just that far because we're afraid that it's going to make people lax, that it's going to give room for sin to grow. That's something else that Paul likes to counter a lot, and he has to. It's a big fancy word, uh, um, word called antinomianism. We're too lenient on sin. That's not what's going on. Because the danger that, the, that Paul is aware of for the Corinthians as he comes down on them for their sin is that he will drive them away from the gospel. He has to remind them that it's all about grace. He has to remind them that they cannot earn anything from God. That God loves them, is pleased by them, sees them as holy in their worst moments and in their best moments. That their relationship with God does not change. Because only out of that foundation, only out of that truth, can they have the freedom, can they have the freedom to truly, actually obey God. And it's just like that with us. We need to have that full freedom of, of relationship. Freedom. No, oh, maybe that's my fault. That full freedom to know that God's love for us doesn't change because our obedience isn't for the heart of Christ. It's from the heart of Christ. It's a response of being loved so much. It's like, that's absolutely what I want to do. Whatever you want me to do, God, because you're so amazing and you have set me free. Any kind of obedience that comes from, oh, God, i got to make you happy because I just screwed up, is actually the opposite of obedience. That's called legalism. God, i got to make you happy because, because I'm not living the right way. God, i got to pray more. God, i got to stop doing this sin in my life, and then you'll be more happy with me. And then I can feel more comfortable with you when I come before you at church or in prayer or to the Lord's Supper. That feeling of needing to like be good with God because you've had a good spiritual day or you've lived a holy day, that's legalism. Ultimately, what it's saying is, God, God, your love isn't as good as you promised. It's actually making small of God's love. God, your grace isn't sufficient enough. You're fickle. Because i got to measure up a little bit, even in the context of being saved. And we think that way because that's the way people are. And we often confuse God for a person. That's what Paul is getting at. That's what he wants us to get at. We need to have that foundation. That's why we need to spend this morning and really hammer that foundation down. Because everybody gets pricked when they walk through 1 Corinthians. Everybody does. So we read together, and if you guys stick with this, and if you, don't, if you miss a Sunday, check it online. Read through the book. It is impossible, if you are honest, to not be challenged by something that the Corinthians are doing wrong. Because we all do it. You have problems with being divisive? I know some of us do. It's easy to get divisive, even as Christians in the church. 
Wrong kind of Christian, right kind of Christian, good church, bad church. Do you have problems with being divisive? What about issues of sexuality? That's a big one in Montreal. I know a lot of us come from broken sexual backgrounds. Maybe those are contemporary issues that we struggle with. Corinthians got them. What about just disputes and arguments with people in your life? Do you have arguments with people? Do you have disputes, conflict in your relationships? Probably. Corinthians got lots of them. They're handling them in all the wrong ways. What about just orderliness in the home, respect in the church? What about pride? Do you struggle with pride? Pride is a major issue for the Corinthians. They're really judging other people and trying to one-up each other all the time. Or maybe just struggle and are confused with areas of, of knowledge and doctrine of the church. Corinthians struggle there too. There's so many things that we're going to explore and discover. And we're going to be challenged. It's a good thing. It's a good letter for that to help help us to respond rightly to Christ, to what he's done for us. But we don't want to come to this letter and then get down on ourselves. Take that magnifying glass, focus in on you and me, right? And then he's all about us and that we got to measure up and all we suck, we're not good enough and throw a pity party and throw that on God's lap. That's not what we're supposed to do. That foundation, we're set free. Of course we make mistakes. We're human. God knows it. That's why Jesus died. We're set free. God's love doesn't change. Didn't change for them, doesn't change for us. His love for us is steady. So we can face every mistake. We can face every sin. And we know that he forgives us. We know that his love is the same as it was yesterday and the day before and the day we first came to faith. And it won't change going forward to the day that he comes in judgment and he says, your judgment has been taken away. You are free to come in and enter into my rest for eternity. It's a guarantee. So now our changes, our, our trying to get things right, what we call our obedience isn't to make God a little bit more happy. It's not to feel like we earned a little bit more, we can hold our head up high as followers of Jesus. It's because we're so overwhelmed by being loved so overwhelmingly. It's a true form of worship because it's born out of the response of being loved and just simply receiving from God and acknowledging that it's actually all about him. So that's the personal challenge. Do you ever feel you need to do just a bit better for God to be more pleased with you? This isn't on the screen. This came up in conversation on the drive-in this morning with my wife. She reminded me of this idea, and I, I like it. Think of the first time. Um, think of that first time that you, you know, when you came to faith, you ask God for forgiveness. You stared into yourself and saw the ways in which you failed to measure up to God's standard when you recognized your need for a Savior. Think of that first time. Because what's so special about that first time is that you don't have anything to your name. You don't have this kind of, I've lived the Christian life. Look at how much I've matured and grown and, and all this stuff. You're like, in your own mind, kind of at the bottom of the barrel. That's kind of how you feel. But yet at the same time, God's love is so amazing. Because you're like, wow, God, you love me. I feel like I'm at my worst here. I've got nothing on my record but bad stuff. And, and I see you hanging on the cross saying that you love me as your life pours out. In that moment... That's the perfect, the perfect moment to understand grace. That moment is how we should see every day. 
You ever feel like you need to do just a little bit better for God to be more pleased with you? You didn't feel that on that day. You fully accepted grace. Remember that day. So this week, bring that back to memory. It's for good reason that throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New, God constantly tells his people, remember. Remember my works. Remember what I have done for you. And the Old Testament is filled with that. That is something that God has done for you. Remember it. Go before God in prayer each time you pray. And remember that. Remember and receive his love to the fullest. Let's latch down that foundation. Make it secure. And in faith, we can move forward and truly respond to him in a worship-filled life. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you and praise you that you have, in your word, in Holy Scripture, have given us so many stories of people getting it wrong. Lord, the heroes of faith, we call them. They're not heroes because of their conduct, of their worthiness, of their obedience. No, God, they are heroes because of their their trust in your provision their trust in your grace, their trust that your love for them never change. We are so prone because of our pride. We want to earn our place. God, help us get our eyes off of ourselves. Let us go to the first thing. Let us go to the foot of the cross. Understand that you love us in our bad days as much as you love us in our good days. You call us not to obedience to earn anything with you, but because you love us perfectly with or without it. Because God, that's how we magnify you. That's how we lift you up when we remove ourselves from the situation. God, you are to be glorified. You are, be, are to be lifted up and made high. You are to be honored. May we be thankful in our remembrance. and May we cherish your love. May we not belittle it. May we not cast it as something that needs to be supplemented. But may we really just focus on that one truth, that you love us. We don't deserve it. There are no conditions attached. Your grace is sufficient. Your grace is enough. And may we live in the freedom to make your name known and to bless your name. Amen. Thank you, Cody. Mm. Let's just uh, let's stand and, uh, and we'll sing together this last song.
the song is 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 uh, written around a scripture from Jeremiah, I believe. I don't remember precisely what it is, but the passage goes, "I know the plans that you have that I have for you, for a hope in a future." And and oftentimes I've heard some people say that it's taken out of context and uh, what was what was God really saying, but I think also just the simple fact that that verse gives so much hope and so much uh, encouragement to, to believers and non-believers alike at, at times of trial that we should not uh, worry ourselves about holding so deeply an important passage because God's word is intended to strengthen us <coughs> to move forward in faith. So the song is called The Plans. We've sung it once before, and we're going to sing it now a second time.
That's the perfect ending right there. I like that. Better than anything I could have thought of. All right, we can all uh, be seated. Thanks. Oh, the drill? Um, so I have no clue, but, you know, I think for just, maybe we want to just get up and maybe just step outside or just see what's going on. Because if there is a fire, I don't know, there's a movie crew out there, maybe they screwed something up, and let's just not... Let's just like scope it out for a minute. We'll put a pause, make sure that we aren't actually in a burning building. <laughs> 